Greetings, fire philosophers. We are joined with truly gracious guest, Joanna Klink, who is a poet and a professor of creative writing here at the University of Texas in the Mishner Center. And we couldn't be more delighted to hear her read one of her poems from her latest collection, The Night Fields, published in 2020. I've known about Joanna pretty much her entire life, my mind. We've only met each other one time, so I'm delighted to be able to be in a poet's conversation and to hear you read this great poem. So I'm really happy to be here with you, Joanna. Thank you. I'm happy to be here, too. So, Joanna, you have selected a reading of the first poem from your collection, The Infinities. So this is a poem in three parts, so I'll just pause between the short sections. The Infinities. I don't know when it began, the will to sort moment from moment, to hold on by saying, I can't care about the red maple stripped of color. I choose the rain disappearing at my feet. I choose this friend to love the deep blacks of summer, abandon the rest. I am unable to picture anything so whole it doesn't crush what's missing. Is it my body across many seasons turning already a little to bone or the slow stars precisely set in depths so vast the sky is just a dome within falling domes? How is the snowfield scattered with dry leaves, already a pavilion of twilight? And my arms just a motion in the great soundlessness of sky. I have traded childhood exuberance for a fragile ax. I will slip into corner tables just to watch people speak. I love the way they lean into each other or stretch back with the blue spun languor of an evening. Lights strung up on the wood ceiling to mimic the lift of stars. There are no empty hopes, but knowing what to hope for is steady work. What was ever so important to you, you left your daily life to heed it. I don't even know what breathes in the dark hills outside this town. Some mornings the roads almost float, the weeds in the fields, wiry fistfuls of sun. What were you looking out for? What did you dismiss along the way? Because we live, we are granted names, streams, Shocks of heat, murmuring summers. All the days you have ever breathed are swallows shooting between trees. When the wind pushes branches in and out of shade, it is an opening, as every small gesture toward another person is incomprehensibly alive. Will you be part of the stoneless passage? When life starts to take things away, will you grow very still beneath the larch or feel the slow flight of birds across your body? The bright key of morning, the bay fanned with foam. Oh, so exquisite. Yeah, it's an amazing poem. Thank you. It's funny when I read my poems, I'm not always in the same state I was when I wrote them, so different things hit me, you know, but yeah, in, in this case, often when I read poems out loud, I'm editing them because yeah. <laughs> I'm not happy with what I said. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I also love um, being a clueless, um, non-professional, somewhat inexperienced reader of poems, even though my wife's a poet and I, I do some poetry, I'm not with the poets at the in the their capacity to read and understand poems and so when i read a poem and this one is very much this way too i can go in all of these different directions 
And I don't know which you meant or which ones you had in mind, and but I can just feed off them in different directions and think this thought through that way and then realize actually it's more interesting to go this way. So reading poetry is a wonderful experience for me as this inexperienced person. But that's, I think that's a good way to read though, to just certain things catch your eye. I think that's my experience of listening to poetry readings too, is you can't focus on everything. You just drift in and out of things that hit you. And that's, I think that's a, that's a good way to read, you know? Okay. Well, I hope so. I confessed to you uh, earlier that I was so passionate about poetry as a younger person. And then yeah. even in my teaching graduate school days, and then something happened where I drifted away from it and reading your poems recently has really reconnected me to that to the essence that I had so fallen in love with back then. So first of all, thank you <laughs> for doing that. I wonder what that's about. We could maybe get get to that later. Can I offer a surprising new question or insight I had as I listened to your, your reading? You know that this substack that we write for, Fire Philosophy, it's centered around philosophy Nietzsche Zen are in the title but you know it's also about how to live so how to live using some of these religious techniques and philosophical te techniques at least that's what the shingle says and so I'm often thinking in terms of Zen you know what what are the core teachings of Zen and for me one of the core pillars of Zen is ancient text called Shin Shin Ming the translated usually as trust in mind Mm -hmm. The first line of which is, the way is not difficult for those who are unattached to their preferences. And when I read the opening line of the infinities, when I listened to you reading it, it's oh, it has such a strong resonance for me to what that Zen poem is pointing to, that it's almost, but you phrase it almost as a question. Like, I don't know when it began, this desire to, I suppose, I don't know if I'm translating this correctly, to pick one thing over another. Right. And then, do you have, does, does that resonate? For, is there some of the Zen, the, does that Zen quality of where the problems start are having to pick and choose, does that resonate at all? I just want to say that I don't know that much about Zen. I do feel like, I'm, I think with the title, I was trying to somehow name like what you can care about in the infinite, infinitely, and you know, how many things there are to care about. There's so many things to care about. And when you're young, you sort of feel like you can think and care about them all. And then as you get older, you realize you're running out of time and you have to make these decisions, you know? And so the beginning of the poem might have been just that sense that oh now i now i really feel the pressure of time and how am i going to choose you know how can i let this friendship go or that activity go or that you know whatever whatever that commitment is go but i, I have to i have to make that kind of decision and i also want to say that when i wrote this poem i was reading adam phillips this british psychoanalyst and literary critic because he has this beautiful book called Missing Out, which he wrote in 2012. And one of the things he talks about in that book is how we live parallel lives. And in one of them, we're just living our life. And in the other one, it's everything we feel we should have lived or everything we have regrets about, or we feel we, we still should live, you know? And we just get so haunted by the myth of our lost potential that we destroy what's right in front of us, you know? And so he talks a lot about needing to have that frustration in order to have satisfaction. And I I, I think I just had this sense of like, okay, I need to be explicit about what I love, um, but I, but right now I don't have a choice anymore. Like I'm, I'm going to be frustrated, but I have to start making these decisions um, because I'm running out of time. Being older than both of you, that sense, I can tell you, will continue to accumulate. I, mean, I keep telling Christophe, and she'll say, well, let's read this, and let's read this. I, nope. 
my time is short. I only got, you know, 15 books left in my life or whatever it is. And I'm going to choose really carefully. Yeah. But I love this opening line because it takes me back to a sense of childhood where picturing a baby where experience is completely undifferentiated, right? Nothing has names. There's red and blue, but they're not differentiated. Everything merges. And it's all one in the sense that the, the whole, that's the whole and the mind of the child. And then you name things and you differentiate and you distinguish and you explicate and you go on and on and on. And that's not well, say that is in, in a sense a fall out of that blissful experience, but it's also gaining the world where right? you, you explicate and you get the world. You can see the leaves on the snow and in ways that you can't unless you have that language. So the process of getting to the point where you can't care about everything and then getting to the point where you recognize that you can't care about everything and then getting to the point later in life where you decide you're only going to care about these things because you only got so much caring left in your life. Right. That's an incredible trajectory. So yeah. I love it that you you said that so beautifully. There's a line that shortly follows this one, Joanna, that I felt the most mystical or the the hardest, well, the, maybe the most poetic line because it seemed to defy logic or played logic games with my head. And I wonder if that was, I assume it was intentional. I am unable to picture anything so whole. It doesn't crush what's missing. And the reason I say that is because there's the negatives and double negatives. I get tripped up. <laughs> Can you say something about that line? No, no. Tell will you say more? Like what you, how you read it? So First of all, I acknowledged to myself that it is playing weird grammatical tricks on me and that I should probably leave it alone. So that was my first, <laughs> because that was the intention to feel this knot of inability, maybe the sense of I shouldn't, I'm unable to. So if I can't immediately understand, I should be okay with that discomfort, but I refused <laughs> And so I tried to puzzle it out and I translated it more rationally or more prosaically as when I picture something with my whole being, this picture is so full and rich that everything that is not getting my attention is crushed in a kind of neglected void abyss yeah and that left me with a question as to whether that's a real dilemma or a false dilemma almost like i don't know this is so off but i think you know if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one to hear it is that really happening or is that our imagination in creating a tragedy out of something that's actually a non-event. I think, but I think you're right that it's, I'm not even sure what I'm trying to say there. Like it was just a tangle of, a tangle in the middle of a poem, you know. Um, but that sounds right to me that there's some sense of just trying to comprehend the whole is just crushing and it's inadequate to my desire, you know, like even when I try to imagine the full the, everything that I could be paying attention to it there's always going to be something that's missing but it's also the opposite like it's just I think it's just that sense of I'm not helped by trying to imagine anything whole anymore I'm helped by just paying attention to the leaves on the snowfield or just the small the small perceptions the rain disappearing at my feet a few a few small things that I can grasp and and give my full attention to and that trying to understand my life and um and what i care about in big broad sweeps is no longer helpful because i always feel crushed by it this was one of my favorite lines too and i took it to be what in zen christoph and i call the koan you probably have heard that word joanna but koan is a puzzle that really evokes your thinking and your needing to get beyond your own thinking. Yeah. 
And so anyway, here's how I read it. Um, let me read the line again. So I am unable to picture anything so whole it doesn't crush what's missing. So I read it finally after I went over it and over it and I loved it. I'm un unable to picture anything so magnificently whole that nothing's left out, right? There's nothing missing. There's nothing missing to be crushed. I can't picture anything that big is what, um, is what it says to me. I can't picture what's transcendent. I can't picture the infinities. I can't picture God. You know, right. It's all way out beyond me. Um, yeah. There's always things missing in my experience. Yeah, yeah. And that's, and that's I think, I think Christoph was kind of getting at that too. And I think that's part of what Adam Phillips was speaking to me with the sense that like the biggest thing you can imagine is always going to leave something out and is going to be in like you, the way our desires work is so yeah, at odds with the ineffable, you know, but I do believe that in my own life, I'm, and I, I feel like in this poem, I'm trying to talk about it, that this focusing on the the one thing just the 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 snow field the smallest scale the reducing the scale and looking at the smallest thing is a way is a kind of portal to understanding these vast energies that you can't bring your mind to directly you know you can only look at the small cell the small piece of snow and then try to through that come to some intuition of of a vaster a vaster order. Yeah, this is one of the, I think, beauties in the art of poetry is the way you write it, especially, Joanna, the attention to the particulars, the exquisite ordinary items that in a non-poetic frame of mind we might not see, but here on the page and through your voice, they take center stage and all of a sudden the infinite is possible just via leaf. And I think that's one, for me, one of the greatest gifts of poetry. Uh, that reminded being reminded that everything is in the leaf so to speak as you were helping us appreciate your own process i was i thought of a meta question which is i know poets i'm going to generalize quite a bit but so forgive me but i think there are cases in which some poets refuse to say anything about their poetry and you seem enlivened by the act of workshopping it and talking it through. Can you say something about your own willingness to talk with us about what some of these lines mean? Well, I think my one of my teachers in grad school was this poet, Alan Grossman, and he he truly believed that poems were transhistorical, that they were taking on issues like Sappho was taking on certain human issues that Ceylon is also taking on and that were like across time human beings are bringing certain needs to poetry again and again he believed that and he also believed that the best way to talk about poetry and to to enter into poetry is to have a poem in front of you and start there always you know and and build out towards bigger concerns. And so I think I, I've always, that's always helped me. It's helped me in, in teaching. It's helped me in my own writing. I do sometimes feel that poets are defensive about their poems. They don't want to have the summary of the poem because they want to say, well, I just said what I had to say and here it is, you know, and I, I do deeply respect that because it's, it's hard enough, you know, to write language that doesn't make sense. But I, I, I think what I've come to is this idea that you shouldn't have anything to defend because poems don't really have to make sense. You're in a better position to hear and receive a poem if you're freed up from having to know what it means. So if if I can just say, I don't know what I was talking about here in these lines, and I'd be very honest with you, you know, most of the time I have no clue. And most poets, you know, if you press them, they'd be like, I truly don't know what that meant. And I don't want to have to explain the state of confusion I was in when I wrote those words, you know. But but I think it also, it should free us up as readers too, because I don't know, I feel like poetry is unnatural. It's unnatural speech. You know, it distinguishes itself from ordinary language. It has a commitment to telling things indirectly, you know, like 
Dickinson says, tell the truth, but tell it slant. You know, it's got a higher degree of patterning than ordinary language. It's got this extreme compression and it privileges sound and word and image over story. So all of these things make it a form that requires a lot of us when we read it. You know, it's not handing over its meanings in any easy way. And I often myself, this is, I'm going down a rabbit hole here, just please interrupt me if, at any point. But I, I feel like it distinguishes itself from efficient speech. You know, we're talking to, to each other and we have to be sort of efficient about our language. Um, journalism would be a kind of speech that has to be efficient and we don't need to feel anything and we probably shouldn't feel anything when we're reading journalism. It's deliberately um, gutted of, of feeling because that circuit of efficient speech is so important, you know? So when you give a talk or write a paper, if you digress too much or you don't make sense or you take too long to get to your point or you don't have a point, you've broken the contract, you know? You're not doing what you're supposed to do, but poetry, just is assuming that most of our experience is inefficient and it's just tremendously complex and our thoughts and feelings are contradictory and precise and overwhelming and the impact of these experiences only unfold gradually in our awareness and at weird angles and weird bursts and you know our lives and ourselves are strange and so they're deliberately to express this, they're deliberately messing with that circuit of communication, you know? So to get back to your question, like the idea of talking about what your poem means or talking about what any poem means, I'm not sure they're meant to mean in the way we think about meaning, or we should be invited to not have to worry about that too much is my sense. And I would just say also that, you know, you never, because poems are sort of poised between speech and music, you never hear people say that they didn't get a song, you know, if somebody plays you a piece of music, you might say, I don't like that band, <laughs> or you might, you know, you might, you might respond to it, like, I like this, or I don't like that, or you might respond to it by saying, it made me feel this, but you wouldn't ever say, I don't get its meaning, you know, if you're freed of the obligation to make sense of it, if you're freed of the obligation to make sense of a poem, then you will actually start to have that experience, you know? So that's why I don't mind questions about meaning because I, I don't really think poets know what they're saying. And I also think that if the, if the message is gonna be communicated, it's gonna be communicated in a chaotic and sidelong way. Can I ask you a direct follow-up to that? In our quests at Fire Philosophy, we always foreground it with this question of how to live. We hope we're not being that, that reductive, but that's our guiding light. Everything that you said, if I were to almost try to turn it into a slogan. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> or, or moral principle or something, it would be something like uh, live in a way in such that you do not feel the the need to worry so much about what your life means. Yes, Right. Right. And is that, do you think that's a, a way of living that is recommended by you or slash poetry? Yeah, I mean, you, but I think when you phrase, phrase it that way, you show the absurdity of that question, like to say, well, what does your life mean? It's such a huge, you can't possibly answer that. Nobody would really try to answer that question, you know? And that's why I think that bias that we bring to poetry, like, I don't, I feel outside of this. I don't know what it means. I don't know if that started with like, a few bad teachers in high school who who told you that you needed to look for those meanings, you know, but it is an absurd question. And I think, yes, absolutely, you, you'll, you'll be able to live or I will be able to live better if I don't think about what my life means. And I'll just be able to focus on moment by moment, sorting my moments and thinking, okay, this has value. Maybe that's not where my attention should go and some of the fine tuned sifting. And I would also say at a bigger scale that, Adam Phillips talks about this too. If you give up on that part of your brain that needs to get something and assimilate information, you give up on what he calls states of conviction, then you'll be flooded with other powerful states, many of which are difficult to express in any clean way. That's a real freeing up of one's life, you know? 
if you don't require immediate intelligibility, what are you freed up to feel, you know? And he says, in what areas of our lives does not knowing, does not getting it, give us more life instead of more deadness? Hearing that, I feel a sense of relief, to be honest. I've admired myself in quantum physics for the last, you know, <laughs> Right. Like, yeah, I got to figure out all of it. And it's like, you're, it's like a bomb to my spirit to hear the, <laughs> this alternate view. But I have to say, my, you know, my father's a quantum physicist and my brother, my brother's a jazz musician and I'm a poet. And I think we're both pressing back against his you know, extraordinary way of looking at the world, which is like, there has to be an, there has to be another way of going about this, you know? I have lots of responses to that. And that's, that's really wonderful. But Take uh, among the arts, um, music it was great to refer to that. This, uh, there's so much to think about there um, where you don't ask of a Schubert piece what it means. Okay. Where, whereas you're inclined, because poets are wordsmiths and you're in language, you're still inclined to want to know what does she mean? But painting is the other example of a word-free art yeah. And painters are much more likely than poets to say, don't ask me what it means, right? It's, it's blue and red and it's, it's here and there. And I just painted it and I didn't mean anything. But there are other painters, other artists who are very articulate about what they're doing and where they're going with their art. And when I stroll through an art gallery, with an artist at that level and the artist will sh painting after painting be able to show me depths that I just don't see. That articulate experience of, of it um, for, for me is very moving. Yeah. So yes, I like to wander through and just have my mind go everywhere, but it's quite another experience and just as rich and meaningful to me to be told to be shown what's there in a painting or in a piece of music or in a poem that I couldn't see because I'm just not there yet. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly think that's huge to have somebody walk you through what they, what they felt and what they intended. I think it's the difference between that and sensing that there is one single meaning or one comprehensive account of a painting like you would never you would never say it has one meaning you'd say like here are a set of energies that are coming at me and they're quite specific so i think that's the distinction and also the difference between these forms of art like sculpture and painting are similar that way they use completely different materials and so in a way you're freed up to just be in the space around a sculpture or you're freed up with a canvas in front of you and you don't have to use words you can but you don't have to. Whereas a poem is, I think that's what I was trying to get at. It's efficient speech, but it's words that we think of as efficient, but they're being put to, they're being torqued in a certain way and put to an inefficient use. And so we think, oh, words, I should quickly know what this means instead of understanding that it's more like a song or an incantation or uh, something hypnotic that is meant to be um, listen to, but probably more importantly, said, it's meant to be said by you. And it's meant to be said again and again, in the way of your dreams, you know, you say something again and again, and then it starts to work on you and you live it and you sleep on it. And maybe at some point in your life, you come back to it because it's changed you, or it's just a part of how you breathe and are, you know, I think that's the distinction. And I think that's why people often feel betrayed by poetry because they feel like I, I don't get it and I'm supposed to get it instead of feeling like okay this is just language but it's not doing what language normally does and that's good and you don't have to worry about it there was a moment like that the second one that felt mystical to me and maybe this painterly way Joanna that I want to run by you I, I'm so curious what your response will be it's the way you ended the second passage the last sentence you wrote, what did you miss along the way? But you end it with a period where grammatically it ought to be a question mark. Right. And um, I'm sorry, Krista, it was dismiss, not miss. Oh, I'm sorry. What did you dismiss along the way? But it's the ending with the period rather than the question mark that really got me. 
Yeah. And it felt like what got me was, I mean, technically it's not a word. It's a little dot made of ink, which is, I suppose, a very microscopic version of a painting. <laughs> but that's pushing it too far, probably. Do you have any insight to share about that particular decision to end that with the period? Yeah, well, I, and I would also say, I love that you read it as miss because it's, it is miss, it, you know, I missed, you miss something. And when you miss something, you're also sort of dismissed, like dismissing it means I saw it and I choose not to pay attention, right? But missing it, like you miss things all the time, you dismiss things all the time. I love that there's that connection between those because so much of the poem is just, I'm trying to refine my hopes, you know, I'm trying to make a daily practice of refining my hopes. Even when you bring the scale down very small, you're just overlooking things all the time and there are huge consequences to you're not paying attention to. So as for the period, I, I'm thinking of what's in my head right now, all the times my editors have written me notes saying, uh, for my whole book saying like, isn't this supposed to be a question mark? <laughs> when, when in fact, I think I like that simultaneity of the question and also the statement, you know, it's a little bit damning of me writing this poem like, I know I dismissed. I was looking up for certain things and because my attention was going in this direction, I was dismissing people and needs and concerns. And that's just the process. And it's kind of, you know, it's unsettling. Yeah, I, I chose my hat this morning to say fierce because that's the ending with the period felt more fierce to me. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and it was like really, yeah, more powerful. Like yeah. you weren't playing around <laughs> with that period. <laughs> I will say that one of the reasons I like writing sequences is because I feel like there's a way of arriving at a provisional realization about something and then you do it, you try again. You know, you didn't get it right the first time and you try again and, and you, and so in that sense, it's a bit like one's life. You know, you just keep trying to build on what you've, it's not really concluded, but what what has sufficed in one moment, you're trying to take it up again. And I think in the third poem here, I was trying to return to this idea like, okay, you're going to dismiss things. And in the third poem, for me anyway, there's the difference between like just living and being alive. And being alive is when you're really, when you're you know, it's an opening as every small gesture toward another person is incomprehensibly alive. So when you're not paying attention to yourself, but you're just really tuned into somebody else, even in the smallest way, that's when you're alive. So it doesn't matter as much that you're missing big things left and right, but you've just made the choice to pay attention to somebody else, <laughs> something that's not you, just for a moment. And that's probably the most spacious and full your life will will ever be you know so that's the the counterweight the counterweight to it um that's a beautiful line i love that one uh, even gestures that you're not aware of yeah uh, towards other people are incomprehensibly alive because they experience it and whether you meant it or not even i mean that our interpersonal relationships are just enormously vibrantly alive yeah and then and that you can do that without always even knowing that you're doing it and um i think that's maybe in this third poem where i was trying to get to is the sense of like you know when life starts to take things away like you have this illusion of being able to make all these choices and then life starts just you know you lose people you lose places you you know you just it's just loss after loss and are you going to in that, looking at things, are you going to tighten yourself up and protect yourself? Or are you going to feel the spaciousness that's opened up by loss and by your lack of choices? You know, like the the bright key of morning, the bay fanned with foam. That's a spacious way of inhabiting loss. And I can't do it very much in my own life, but I have this image of like what that would be like to, to move through the world which is shot through with loss in a way that is not so much like, oh, I'm I'm sorting what has meaning and I this has meaning and this doesn't have meaning, but just like I'm being handed the meanings constantly. I'm being handed what's important all the time, not by my own choosing, you know? And that sense too, that like we value things most when they're just about to disappear, you know? Like, 
it's not your choice, but you can you can make so much of the smallest thing that's given to you. That ending to the poem is just so beautiful because there are sentences throughout the poem. There are sentences and sentences are, are meanings and thoughts and so on. But you end just with two images. The bright key of morning is not a sentence. It's just an image of the morning and the sunrise and the bay with the wind fan, fanning the foam. Just, oh, it's so beautiful. Those images explode. That's a strange thing in writing poems too, that sometimes you try so hard to say something and you and you can't, and then it's just a, a sideways image or glimpse of something that conveys it better than trying trying to say it, you know? Yeah. In this part of the poem, in the middle part, there's one line that is somewhat out of character with the rest of the poem, where you get really clear and explicit philosophically, and you say, there are no empty hopes. Like all hoping is beseeching and opening and striving and praying and, yeah. and so on. And then, then you say, but knowing what to hope for is steady work, right? Where the first image is just hoping against all hope you know, disaster won't strike or that yeah. beauty will occur or something. But then knowing what to hope for, what to focus your hopes on, that's work. That's a discipline. That's what you do religiously to right. prepare yourself to be ready to experience the depths of your hopes. So yeah. that line, those two lines just set the whole thing up for me in a way, and, and it was clearly one of the reasons why, I, as I said earlier, I read it as a deeply spiritual poem. Yeah, that's so beautiful the way you put that, because I, I do think those are those are two movements. One of them is just, I know hoping is powerful, you know, that bearing of hope is powerful. And then the steady work of needing to refine the hopes I feel like those are two gestures that we almost do them at once in a way. Hoping, just hoping is being vulnerable. Right? And you hope you're vulnerable because you're not going to get it. You know? But when you hone your hopes and get serious about um, what you should be staking your life on, yeah. um, then you your, your vulnerability is still there. Maybe it's even more intense in some ways, but you're also bringing in its scope so that you maybe less shattered or more. I'm not sure about that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, I do, I, I think I'm starting to understand myself as being, I wouldn't necessarily call myself a religious poet, but I do, I do have this kind of bearing, which is sort of hard to articulate, but I, I was reading the New York Times this weekend and there was an interview with the writer Marilyn Robinson and she was talking about the spiritual bearing of certain writers. And I wrote down this quote somewhere. She said, there's a holiness in the fact that people are living in the world in a way that makes them feel that the world is addressed to them. Mm -hmm. And I, I just love that because mm -hmm. I do feel that the world is somehow addressed to me and I can't quite say why, you know, but I think in writing poems, I understand writing poems as being a way of speaking back. You know, I feel like somehow this is, I'm being spoken to. And so writing a poem isn't ever starting with nothing. It's, it's speaking back to some message that I feel is coming towards me, even though I couldn't say what that is. Oh my God, that's so exquisitely gorgeous. Uh and I hope you don't mind my saying this, Joanna, <laughs> but... Uh, I happen to know because he was one of my teachers that Joanna's father um, is both a professor of physics, physics, a physicist at the highest level and a deeply religious person. Um, and that those two things come together in him as they do in other physicists who are trying to think infinity in their own way and come to the the obvious conclusion that you can't, but you think as far as you can, and then somehow open yourself religiously to yeah. the rest. So right. no matter how you think of yourself, because I know your father, <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> and I know that something's been imprinted in you. <laughs> yeah, no, that's absolutely that's absolutely true. He would he would be like chuckling right now because I think you know we've pushed back against him so much, but I there is just this kind of I don't I don't know I can't express it exactly, but this kind of way of thinking about forces moving through the world and as you said that there would be a limit that rational thinking can take you to a certain point and after that is this sort of reverent surrender to everything that's beyond it that you know is informing the precision and the mathematics and the design you know beautifully put thank you so joanna when you were speaking about that exquisite way of poetry being a call and response between the poet and the world I just thought historically that poetry used to be what literature was. When you talk about literature, it's po poetry until the novel shows up. But these days, at least from my experience, poetry is not widely read, certainly nowhere close to what it was. And I wonder, do you think people would live better lives if they read more poetry? Or, or does that sound too crude? No, I don't think it sounds too great. I think I don't I wouldn't want to be pres prescriptive about it, but I do think that there's some kind of quiet composition of oneself in the presence of a poem that is really powerful, especially when people are going through grief, um, which is why after 9-11, sales of poetry books just shut up in airports, if you can believe it. Just, you know, there are these moments in time when people just rush for poems because they're looking for a way to take a bearing on what's happened to them. And, you know, they allow you to experience extreme states and find a shape for that. So I do think that people would be, you know, they would find some solace in that. I, I think, you know, we're in a strange moment right now where um, poems are very political and you can see why, because people are really trying, grappling with so much inequality and war and just, you know, these issues that are so profound and ongoing, and they're trying to make poems speak back to that. Um, and sometimes that can feel just as alienating as reading an obscure poem that's bordering on nonsense. You know what I mean? So I think there are lots of reasons why people get turned away from poems or can't find a place in them. But I think that essential gesture to turn to a poem in order to be brought back to your senses and brought back to who you are. And in a way, it's not just who you are. It's the world as it is and the world as it might be at the same time. And you, you hold it together in you. And it's just a beautiful moment of respite, I think, from the terrible on ongoingness of the world, you know? So I think in a way, poems give us this way of living that requires our participation more than our understanding. Like we just have to participate in a poem to feel its effects. We don't have to understand it. And that's also, it's such a solace for me. I can pick up a poem, not know what it means, but feel by the end of it that I've changed a little or that the world has shifted just a tiny bit or that my grief has been softened. And that's enough to sometimes just keep going. I have two thoughts that run counter to your sense, Christoph, that um, poetry is disappearing. And um, one is that young people are gathering to recite poetry again and have been for the last decade in interesting ways. It tends to be not so much read as recited and heard and experienced in the presence of people. Of course, now a lot of that is Zoomed. But the other is that because there's a long history going way back into ancient Greece and in other cultures where nobody would think of um, having a poet, a poem that was not set to music. And much of the poetic experience that I think people have today comes in song lyrics, yeah. um, which even rhyme, right? right. <laughs> I mean, in the old poetic sense. And so actually, everybody's listening to music and everybody's taking in poems in that way. And there are lots of bad lyrics, I mean, inane, terrible lyrics, but there are also some good ones which are simple and direct and yeah. heartfelt and go right to some really deep issue. 
and they can be buried in the music where you can attend more to the, the accompaniment of the, of the lyrics, or you can attend to the lyrics or both. But I think that is um, for many people the way, and I don't think they think of this explicitly, but that's the way people are taking in poetic language more than buying poetry books and going off and reading them. Yeah. Yeah, and I do think people are reading poems online. If you don't have to buy a book, you can look up one poet and one poem by one poet. But I think you're right too that the just the recitation, the this new eruption of young people reciting poems is I just find that so heartening because I think that's part of the original intent of poems was, you know, you're the one who's supposed to voice it. It's not somebody else voicing it, you know, and you, and it's the process of saying it out loud that makes you realize that it's music. It, you put yourself physically into a different state when you recite it, you know, and then you have these, you know, if, it, if they're great poems, they're often just on the border of nonsense, like the opening of Gerard Milley Hopkins, The Wind Hover, is he's watching Falcon in the sky. He says, I caught, I caught this morning, morning's minion, kingdom of daylight's dauphin, dappled dawn drawn falcon in his riding of the rolling underneath him level air. You know, and just just that kind of like, you just feel the bird, you know, riding these currents. And that's what really great poetry can do is just you start saying it aloud and it doesn't matter that it's on the edge of nonsense. It's something that you are, it's like you've stepped into a moment and you're inhabiting that moment briefly. I mean, quite, quite similar to chanting services in the religious context where- Yes, yes. In fact, it's it probably is more useful if you have zero idea of what the words mean because you yes. get you the vibrations on the physical level. Yes, yeah. And that's one of the reasons I, when I teach workshops, I'm always trying to defend those lines and poems that everybody wants to take out, the lines that don't make any sense. Because I think usually what the lines that don't make sense are when the poet is really trying to say the hardest thing and they're trying and it's coming out in a garble, you know, like... I am uh, I am unable to picture anything so whole it doesn't crush what's missing. Like I have no idea, like that was just a garble, you know? Um, and But it's usually the moment where you're trying to say something important and it's the surface picturability of things just falls apart, but you feel these energies of urgency and trying to say 10 things at once, you know? We have people who care about this question of how to live and they've found us through Dale's work and being interested in Nietzsche, philosophy, and Zen. I wonder if you have any parting thoughts or anything that you would want to say to this audience of ours about this question of how to live from the perspective of a poet's mind. I think just on this small scale that if I, if I answer the question in terms of like, what is writing poetry and reading poetry help me do, or how does it help me be? How does it help me in a daily way? I would say I I read poems to to drop into another order of time. It's a, it's a very wonderful way if you're really busy and frustrated and overwhelmed to just be reminded that there's a different order of time. And then in that you, are absorbed in sound and feeling and you're reminded there are these frequencies that you normally aren't tapped into that are there and available to you all the time you know just of, of feeling and contradictions between thinking and feeling and intensities and then I guess I also read to feel less alone one of the beautiful things about poems is that you know, Keats is dead and Dickinson is dead, but I feel when I read their poems that I'm being spoken to. So they almost just cross over the boundary of death and speak to me in this very intimate way. So I, I don't feel as alone and I, I feel the the stakes of, of being alive. And as we've talked about, sometimes it's these tiny registers of perception. If I, if I read a really like Seamus Haney or some poet who's just got these beautiful, small intuitions and perceptions of things. I can go out for a walk and I'm seeing the world 
in a much more sensuous way, sensual, sensuous way. And just to be reminded that those small registers of perception are there is, is a big deal. And I guess also there's some sense of, you know, when you're really overwhelmed by life and you turn to a poem, you, you can be in that state. I talk about this in another poem I've written, that sense that I cannot tell what is unbearable in me from what is opening. Sometimes you just feel that the unbearableness of daily life and a poem can bring you back to the fact that that unbearableness is just the beginning of some kind of change in you that you could be attending to in a different way. And I think that's, for me, that's just... That's why I'll always go back to poems first, because they remind me of that transformation is always possible, even in the the tiniest levels. Wow. <laughs> this was terrific, Joanna. I really appreciate it. Um, Thank you so much for <laughs> bringing me on. And yeah. it's I, I feel the generosity in, in your taking any time to read my poem. No, other way around. Uh, your, your poem is itself generous. You're a great poet and, and you're incredibly articulate and talking about it. It was wonderful. Thank you for having me. Joanna, thank you so, so much. 